Welcome to Gu Dao Jingxing, Walking the Timeless Way, a podcast that digs deeply into the ancient texts of Dao De Jing to uncover its timeless wisdom and discuss how to live it in today's chaotic world. I'm David Wang, executive coach and consultant. I'm joined by my co-host Ian Felton, a practicing psychotherapist and coder. Hi, Ian. Morning, David. Good morning to you. Good to see you. Yes,、uh, we are、uh, studying. We're still with、uh, in uh, chapter sixty-four,、uh, and、uh, you know we have、uh, done the line by line reading and translation, and from there, you know, on that basis, on on that foundation. Now we're talking more about this chapter. Yeah, there's there's still so much that we could say, and and we always try to make things tied in into our personal lives. So that our goal, of course, is to always try to apply these things. And so I know today. We're really going to talk about kind of looking at the small, the the things that were discussed in Chapter sixty four.、Um, some of these really famous sayings, such as、uh, the the ten thousand mile journey begins with a a single step, and and things like like that. Yes. And so, I I know I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts on. You do a lot of work in in business, and you do a lot of of coaching. And and we've kind of talked about these Taoist concepts of not not putting our attention on some giant grand objective. Not that we shouldn't have goals, but. That the key thing is is kind of taking whatever that next small step is, and and I'm kind of curious in in how in in your work as an executive coach and 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 also as a mentor to to young people,、mm-hmm. what that looks like to you.、Um, I think overall,、uh, you know, one word that、uh, categorizes. The workplace、uh, today is constant change.、Mm. I think、uh, you know that change.、Uh, I think is energizing on the one hand and also exhausting on the other,、uh, because the executives I work with, and、um, they, a lot of times,、uh, they are. Really, part of that,、uh, you know, making change to happen, making making change happen, and、um, I a lot of times the work I I do with them is to help them sort through、uh, themselves how to adapt to that change, and then how to communicate that change、uh, with the people they work with. I think that's the kind of the starting point. Uh, to uh, to answer your question, what that means, I, you know, over the years, I found out that we as individuals, no matter where you are in that organization,、um, whether you're the top executive or you're the、uh, new person who just joined the company,、um, you have to、uh, learn and adapt all the time uh, uh, in that kind of environment. To be successful and to be effective, learning and adapting all the time—that sounds like a really, really big, big, big lift. And and what mindset do you sort of see? I mean, who are the people that you work with where they seem to do well with that? And and what kind of qualities or or attitude or approach do you see? And them, and then, and then contrast that to the people who really struggle with with that.、Mm, that's a great question.、Um, I would say,、uh, you know, people who have 
more open-mindedness. Maybe uh, another, uh, in recent years, another concept is people with a growth, growth mind tend to do better. Uh, those people who really believe in the possibility of learning, you know, they, they know that they can get better if they learn constantly. And people who are curious and humble, uh, they, they tend to do better. And uh, people who uh, feel like um, two kinds of people, uh, you know, people who believe that they are already very successful uh, and they stuck in the current situation. Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, you know, the, really uh, what we're seeing today is, you know, what, have, what has got them here today won't necessarily get them there. So, mm. But in their mindset, they feel like they know how things work. Mm. Uh, so that kind of person, I think it's hard for, it's hard for them. And, uh, the other kind of person is, um, harder is people who have, people who have lost hope, people may become uh, cynical in the organization. Uh, usually they tend to be the people who st spend several years in a company. When you first join, you know, we call it, you know, a honeymoon period. You know, everything is shiny and rosy and you want to make an impact. I think after a few years, uh, you know, the people, uh, some people find it's a good fit uh, uh, in some way. Uh, they, they perform, they do well. And some people who don't, but there are some people who somehow who don't have many options externally, but they somehow they stay, but they stay, but they are not moving up. These are the people who seem to be stuck at some point. Hmm. And so there's a, a few things there. One that, that really stood out to me is the people who maybe had success in, in the past in a certain way, but then the environment changes. And mm -hmm. if they keep trying to apply the same methods and aren't open to understanding how, how things have, have changed, they might kind of, there's almost kind of like a, a stubbornness to it. Yeah, yeah. I think the somehow, um, somehow I think it has something to do with, uh, you know, with, with several with with the aspect uh, of their personality. I would say, if we apply the, you know, the big personality, the five, you know, the ocean, big five, model, yeah. yeah, big five, yeah. yeah. And maybe we can just break those down. There's openness conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and, and neuroticism. And so uh, openness, kind of talking about people who, again, they're, they're, they're sort of open to new ideas, new experiences, versus um, on the other end of the spectrum, people who kind of like structure, they like things to be um, kind of predictable they're 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 they they really don't necessarily enjoy surprises and this is a spectrum so i'm not saying that this is a black and white kind of, all of these attributes are a spectrum and and a blend and a mix and it kind of gives us all this rich personality but when when um we're thinking about these characteristics just to give a little bit of, of background personality has had possibly more research put into it than any other um, psychological factors. And this particular measurement of personality has proven to be 
Um, you know, again, none of these things are the absolute truth. They just, they're kind of maps that we can use, but this particular one seems to measure personality more accurately than, for example, um, even like Myers-Briggs, which is obviously also very, very popular. But this one focuses on um, the big five, as you said. Um, so openness is one. Then the C, um, you're, you're talking about ocean to remember it. So O for openness, C for conscientiousness. And, and this is sort of someone who really pays attention to detail versus someone who kind of is, is less interested in that and, and, and may be happy to kind of um, ignore that level of uh, attention to detail. Extroversion, you know, how, how much does someone kind of, um, you know, put their, um, get their energy from connecting with others versus sort of being more um, reserved. Agreeableness, um, you know, are, are, are people more interested in kind of creating harmony and rapport with others versus sort of, you know, keeping their, their boundaries up and, and, and maybe kind of buckling down into their own positions more. And then finally, neuroticism, which is sort of like, you know, how, how much emotional turmoil does someone ex yeah, ex experience in, inside? Yeah, exactly. Uh, interestingly, that kind of mix, uh, uh, you know, how things are configured uh, varies uh, from personality to personality. Uh, I do not have the full view of all different kinds, but it seems to me that uh, we just talked about, you know, th uh, these people, let's say, are struggling with uh, change. Um, I think paradoxically, they tend, sometimes they tend to be the top performers uh, or perceived as top performers in the company because these people tend to be, you know, more conscientious, more responsible. Uh, they pay a lot of attention to details, but they end up the ones who are less open-minded uh, to new experiences. Uh, I'm not saying it applies to all individuals. If you have uh, individuals who are very uh, reliable, but at the same time, who are more open-minded, uh, I think uh, that usually, you know, uh, these are, are the kind of people who seem to be, uh, you know, well perceived in the company because they're doing well, they're performing and delivering, but at, at the same time, because of the fact they have, they are more open-minded, they have more potential. And and let's make this connection to um, Dao De Jing. When we we talk about um, Wu Wei and, mm. and and kind of also, you know, the Dao being being like like water, mm. I can't think of a, a better metaphor again than um, f for openness than the quality of water. Um, there's that. Um, it's not necessarily in, in chapter sixty four, but that metaphor of of the ocean and how it it receives everything. It doesn't reject anything. And and how can there be anything more open than than water in the ocean that just sort of is open to whatever flows into it? Exactly. Exactly. I think that water is a perfect metaphor uh, for. Uh, open-mindedness. Uh, I think um, the spirit of our time, uh, you know, requires uh, more of that uh, from individuals. Uh, based on, yeah, yeah, listen to one another, adapting, uh, and be. Um, I think it's just like be more sensitive, may be more aware of what's going on both outside and inside of you mm. and 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 outside and and inside and and of course as a therapist there's this uh, approach that we take to um psychological flexibility and and that's exactly 
what we have to pay attention to to mm -hmm. to get that. Mm -hmm. And when when you're talking about these um, these situations and organizations where where we have to adapt and and we have to reinvent ourselves, mm -hmm. making that connection back to to chapter sixty four, reinvention is obviously a big process. It's a lengthy process, in other words. It's it's it not, is. We we can think about it like that thousand mile journey, and 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 of course we'd have to do that one step at a time. We we can't just go to a workshop for three days and now I'm I'm reinvented and you know the work is done and now I can just sort of do what I'm 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 doing because I went to this workshop. Mm -hmm. It's this constant process of um, investing in this this thousand mile journey and if we really wanted to be honest about it it's a it's a never ending journey that is as long as we're wanting to participate in this this growth mindset uh, really what we're doing is investing in this growth mindset versus any particular skill versus any particular way of looking at things. And one of the things that is really critical to that is looking at our relationship to our, ident and our identity. Mm, mm, mm. Can, you say, can you say more about that? Because I thought that this is an interesting connection. Sure. So our, what, what we tend to do is get reinforced either positively or negatively throughout our particularly our childhood when we're more um, impressionable. Mm -hmm. And we tend to form identities around that. So in, in the most generic terms, the aspects of ourselves where, that we either feel good about ourselves or, or bad about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and over time, then that can become our, our identity. And, mm. and, and when we really believe that those beliefs about ourselves are true, mm -hmm. then, then that growth mindset becomes, um, it becomes a barrier to that growth mindset. Mm. Because if maybe I did really well in, in high school and mm. maybe I did really well on standardized tests mm. and, and maybe I graduated summa cum laude from, mm. you know, a, a really good school at 22. And now I have this identity as, you know, this kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm intellectually superior. See that, you know, what you're saying here, that also describes uh, the type of people I just, uh, you know, refer to uh, in the uh, organization. I think yeah. the people who are perceived as uh, top performers, they have, you know, mm -hmm. they are forming mm -hmm. an identity around him, him or herself. Mm. Yes. And, and so the problem with that then is that when when it comes time to, to have present moment awareness, you know, being in the moment, something that as a Taoist, we're, we're always talking about, you know, really being in, in harmony. I mean, being in harmony with everything around us mm -hmm. is, is sort of one of those key principles, just like water sort of tries to take the shape of whatever is happening and kind of like tie that together. When our focus is on those identity constructs versus really that openness of, of making that connection to the external world, a, a few things happen that make us psychologically inflexible. Mm. One, we're probably not in the present moment anymore because now rather than actually having that connection to the present, mm. we're thinking about 
all these things um, about our identity that kind of make us right in that moment versus necessarily being open to taking in other perspectives or, or new ways of, of doing things. It also likely might put us in, in conflict with maybe some values that we had earlier on in our careers when we were more maybe excited and um, enthusiastic and passionate and still learning. The before, beginner's mind. The beginner's mind. Yes. And, and so what happens then, we can kind of crystallize around these identity constructs, which then makes us psychologically inflexible. And then that becomes a barrier to this growth mindset. I see. Do you see any kind of a positive or uh, any benefits to holding on to that uh, self-formed identity? Uh, there must be some utility in addition to the maybe the side effects, shall we call, like the side effects of that selfhood or self-identity. Well, I think ultimately at the end of the day, Mm. They're, they're all kind of conveniences for us to have um, an ability to, to navigate our lives that mm. all these things, it's that there really isn't that much difference about our beliefs about the world that we use to navigate um, the environment than our beliefs about ourselves, that they're all what we would call heuristics or, or shortcuts, right? Shortcuts. Yeah. They're all shortcuts that we use just to navigate the world, but they're not necessarily any truer than, you know, these identity constructs aren't necessarily any more true than these beliefs that we develop about life and in general, just as a means of, of navigating the environment. So they're all really just conveniences. I see. I see. So, in other words, the ability to recognize when you are using that as a shortcut for navigation and, and also, you know, the, uh, maybe the long-term or the deeper side effects of that, uh, that tool mm. is the, really the key here, right? So it's not like, um, mm -hmm. can you, I'm, I'm just trying to think that it's not like, we're saying you have to abandon that. It's almost impossible to abandon. It is that. impossible. Yeah. Right. It's our changing our relationship to it. Mm -hmm. tell, tell, tell our listeners more about changing our relationship to it. Well, the beliefs that we have around, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm competent for, I'm a competent person. Yes, we we kind of need that level of, in in some ways, we could look at it like a defense mechanism, and and I'm not saying that in a negative way. We have to have we we've evolved to have defense mechanisms to help us deal with anxiety, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and so they're not bad things. But what we have to recognize is this something that I'm enacting and 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 holding on to very tightly mm -hmm. because it's protecting me from some anxieties mm -hmm. or is it helpful to me and and so the the pragmatic question that i think we can ask ourselves rather than holding on to these identity constructs like they're these real things about me, you know, I am this, I am mm -hmm. that, or I am not this, or I am not that, is, you know, my relationship to that in this moment, is it helping me? Is it helpful to me mm -hmm. right now? Is, is me clinging on to this identity, this aspect of my identity, is it helping me right now? So for example, thinking about when you were talking about these high performers and, mm -hmm. Um, an organization, it sounds like there's places where in the past, them having that sort of mindset might have actually helped them. Maybe earlier on in their career, that might have helped them. Oh, indeed. Uh, I think uh, early on, I think a lot of that uh, 
uh, the the their self identity and also the identity they they kind of uh, project to the outside world, right? The identity they show up uh, at the meetings uh, with their colleagues. Uh, to a great extent, it was extremely helpful because people are able to see, you know, how confident they are, how competent they are. I think, you know, that brought them to the level of uh, top performers. Mm. That's one of the reasons why it's so hard to let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they got a lot of, um, they were re rewarded a, a lot for that um, maintaining that identity. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, I, I think at least early on, there's, I would say there's a point of diminishing return. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's the problem that they are not sometimes not, they are getting, maybe getting too carried away that they are not able to recognize that point of diminishing return. When mm -hmm. I say the point of diminishing return is, uh, it's becoming counterproductive mm. that their ego or that strong mm. self-image is kind of starting to stand in the way of getting other ideas. So in other words, that mm. harmony with mm. other, other people around them uh, is, uh, is at risk or is mm. hindered. And so that's the, that seems to me then to be sort of this inflection point where, okay, I, I need to take some more steps in my journey to reinventing myself. Yes, yes, I think uh, that. Um, okay, it's it's interesting that uh, we're we're you know talking about this word reinvention. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that reinvention is to what extent? It it sounds to me the first reaction when I hear that word, um, you know, because it's uh, I think. It's being in the use a lot in the business world, uh, both at the individual level and also in at the company level, organizational level, a lot, giving all the changes. But I sometimes I was wondering whether that reinvention is really kind of the essence of it is evolution or evolving, because that evolving has a a natural naturalistic. Uh, flavor to it, as opposed to, oh, I want to reinvent myself and according to my uh, aspiration or goals. Mm. That feels a little, yeah, the one feels a little, um, so reinvention seems a little almost unrealistic where, and, and maybe a little detached from reality. And I think it also, in, in some ways, could have the effect of disconnecting us from the wisdom of our own past that like oh this 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 old self had no value and so i need you to, have to put it away right self, put that away yeah. yes and you have to grow up or change another uh 180 degree to another new person that sounds too i, I think very mechanistic to me or too dramatic because you know if you know as we study in Tao. Uh, according to that yin and yang force, it is really like how they work together, right? It's one in the other. So, so let's say you're in a kind of yin mode. Uh, you don't want to like switch, <laughs> you know, drastically to a yang mode, but you want to take some yang and and transform it. Yeah, and 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 so that's you know kind of leaning into this metaphor of of um evolving rather than reinventing uh, you know chapter 64 also talks about building a temple and if and if we're thinking about using that metaphor mm. you know it's an evolution that we're we're not talking about taking a temple that we've built tearing it down and building a new one mm. you know Lao Tzu talks about we're building a nine story temple. And if we're looking at th that metaphorically uh, as our, our life and our life's work that, you know, we, we need to build, what's it going to take to build 
another floor on this on this temple and maybe on this next floor there's different characteristics and there's there's you know maybe maybe more more yang or maybe more yin than yang to to try to create more balance and, and harmonize that but that doesn't mean that we throw away all of the floors that were underneath we just want to add more bricks and 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 to do that of course we can only do it one one brick at a time i, I like that I, I think you know uh when you're talking about this i i immediately i think about uh, feng shui i think hmm. building that tower you have to survey the landscape of the mountain let's say that oh. that a nice story to, uh, tower uh you have to decide where to build it because otherwise it's becoming a leading tower <laughs> <laughs> and someday it will fall apart. So things like that, uh, I like what you're saying is, um, I think it's intentional to some extent, but it's intentional, but it's not like very, let's say ego driven. Like let's build that tower to show everybody that that, that is the world's tallest tower, right? Mm. That, that um, I think there's a different kind of mindset, even in building that tower. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm so happy that you brought that up. Um, the idea of feng shui, just so that we're we're able to then to to kind of show the context around building that next brick on, on ourselves. That when we're thinking about putting that next brick on on the temple of ourselves we're not doing it in an in an egocentric way using the concept of feng shui we want to look at what's going on in in this environment i mean so i'll i'll kind of break down and mm -hmm. and and feel free if i'm not saying this right to to jump in cuz i'm certainly not an expert on it but but feng is is wind and shui is water yes and and feng shui is really just kind of talking about you you want to make sure that whatever you're making this is particularly around architecture right it, is in harmony with the environment i think that's the essence of it uh when we build something when we find a, a place to live uh, you know, met metaphorically, I would say even we are trying to uh, launch a new venture or initiative, we need a kind of a study more carefully about the feng shui around it, not just the physical thing, right? Finding an office because that's where, you know, they sometimes in Hong Kong and other places, uh, they hire a consultant, uh, a feng shui consultant. But I think what people are missing is Let's say we let's say we want to um, create a new market, or even enter into the uh, existing market. I think to be more aware of what's going on in that space, it's another level of understanding the, the feng shui for your business, and, right? Not not just uh, where you place your table, where you're facing, you know. Uh, uh, you know whether your window is facing south or facing you know west yeah and so on the individual level this might be um um well i'll kind of just i'll use myself as an, a, an example when i was in software it was always kind of looking at what technologies were out there and and trying to think about well whatever this next technology I'm, I'm going to learn is, how does that fit within what direction it looks like the whole industry is going? I don't want to learn something just because, um, you know, if, if I really want to apply it, I want to make sure that it's going to be useful in, in the industry and not just something that, um, you know, my favorite, kind of blogger uses on on his website i mean if you want to do it as a hobby that's that that's fine but kind of seriously looking at well whatever this next thing that i learn is or 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 this next level that i build on the temple how's it going to fit into 
um, not only what's going to be valuable to me, but valuable for for others. Exactly. I think that's a smart thing to do. Uh, you know, I think this is another example of probably the one of the key lessons for this chapter. Um, you know, I thought about, I have a question I want to ask you. Uh, you know, I have an answer in my mind, but, you know, we, maybe we can uh, compare notes. If you have to give a, a title to this chapter, 64, uh, what will you, what title will you come up with? Just to the essence of this whole chapter. It doesn't have to cover every, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. every line, as we discussed, is really very valuable and, you know, full of meaning. Mm -hmm. But the whole flow of the messaging for this chapter. Well, I think it, it I would, I would say take life one, one moment at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. That, that if, if, if you get too attached to your expectations about yourself and, mm -hmm. and the world, I think there's going to be a lot of disappointments. And, and then I think we can also then give up and, and quit picking up that next brick to build our, our temple. Mm. But if, but if we are just taking life one moment at a time, one step at a time, that one, it, it becomes more manageable. I only, mm -hmm. I only have to pick up, I don't have to build a whole new floor. Mm. I just, I just have to put one more brick on, on the, the structure. I see. I see. Um, I think that's a good one. I think you mentioned the time. I also agree with you. I would like to add one dimension. Yeah. I want to know uh, what your title is. Right. Yeah. My title is the wisdom of time and timing. Mm. I think those are two different things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think this chapter, you know, as you mentioned, uh, talks about the, the compounding effect of time. Mm -hmm. In other words, like we start small, but we build up, you know, incrementally and gradually, you know, with mm -hmm. all these metaphors of building the, the tower, the, the, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also to uh, walk long miles, mm -hmm. you know, I think it has a lot to do, like, say, you just cannot, um, you cannot accomplish something big. Uh, you, you have to have, you have to take into, a, uh, the, uh, take into account time. Just as uh, some people say, I think recently I, I saw a quote, which is very powerful. Uh, that quote says, you have to be uh, impatient with actions, patient with results. Mm. I think that powerfully illustrates mm -hmm. that results uh, come with t time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, we're slow in taking action. So mm -hmm. impatient with actions, but patient with the results. I, I think that's perfect. And, and I'll, I'll kind of put it in... Um, psychotherapy terms, for example, that when when people are either depressed or or anxious or or kind of feeling mm -hmm. really upset in a certain way, and and this gets in the way of them having the kind of life that they want, because we'll we'll call it um, avoidant strategies that. Basically, mm. people then might start organizing their lives around the uncomfortable feelings. Mm. They don't necessarily take action on on the things that that they might actually enjoy in life, whether it's you know going going to a party or or connecting with a hobby or something that they enjoy because they're waiting until they feel better. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. Before taking the actions mm. and and so what you're saying makes perfect sense that f the people who can and and i'm not saying this is easy it's it's incredibly hard but it doesn't change the fact that that's kind of what has to happen is that we have to kind of 
make room for those uncomfortable feelings and still engage with those actions because over time the results are my depression might decrease my anxiety might lessen so for example if i have social anxiety if i wait until i don't have social anxiety until i go to a party well that's never going to happen i'm if i'm waiting for the results before i take action it's just never going to happen but if i'm willing to be impatient with the action and say you know what i got invited to a party i'm you know, I, I've learned a few techniques for sort of managing my anxiety somewhat. So I'm, I'm willing to go and take this action, even though I know it's going to take a while. I might have to go to, to 50 parties until my anxi- until I have the results of, you know, my anxiety has decreased 50% because I've sort of, you know, taken these actions to to gain some self-efficacy and some mastery around these social situations. Interesting. Uh, you know, as I'm listening, I'm thinking, uh, you know, some of the uh, per- perfectionist uh, tendencies, I was wondering whether, you know, there's some research there that tries to study the connection between that uh, sense of uh, uh, perfection with so- social uh, anxiety, because I feel like sometimes, let's say, uh, getting back to the uh, uh, metaphors in this chapter, uh, if you are building that nice story tower or you are making a, tr- a journey of uh, ten thousand miles, uh, you know what's going through in that person's mind that stops the person from laying the first brick might be, you know, how other people will see the tower, right? The tower, is it going to be very, um, very successful, right? Is that 10,000 journey, am I going to be like robbed on my way or some people I couldn't trust? I think a lot of the things, you know, I, I think kind of stopping people from being impatient. It's, it's almost the answer lies in being impatient with the actions, right? In order to have that breakthrough. Mm-hmm. But we are kind of stuck because we're like a walking in circles. Mm-hmm. Well, there's, I, I, I can't quote the research, but I've, I've done um, a fair amount of looking in, into this because it is so common, particularly around mm. um, people in, in, more professional positions, but a relationship between perfectionism and, and fear fear of failure. I mean, they're intricately related, and it's not that hard to see that. Mm. You know, if, if I have a deep fear of failure, then I'm also going to be very fixated on doing things absolutely perfectly, and then because then anything short of perfectionism can be experienced as a giant threat, you know, this, you know, making a mistake is, is a huge threat that, that, um, a mistake might lead to being harshly judged, losing my job, losing my reputation. And so now I have, I'm, I'm so preoccupied with laying that next brick on the temple, because if it's off even a little bit and, you know, someone sees that, then, you know, now I might become a failure, I get fired, what, whatever. Um, and that's a real problem. It is, for, it is, yeah. it is. So, um, you know, for the benefits of our listeners, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, what are some of the techniques or hacks that can uh, maybe trick the individual, let's say, uh, from being preoccupied with these uh, imagined disasters or failures and, and, and kind of start to take action and, 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 and take that first step? Well, I think there's a couple things. One, there is, um, you know, my supervisor in psychotherapy shared with me um, this, this metaphor of, of, of perfectionism and imagining 
someone with perfectionism, there's a, a card of apples and, 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 and you can't eat an apple until you have the perfect apple. You've got to find the perfect apple out of that card of, of apples. Mm. Well, well, what do you actually have to do to find the perfect apple out of that card of apples? You have to uh, throw some and a taste, maybe have a bite and have a try. To yeah, you'd have it. to take a bite out of every apple. You'd All have right. to inspect every apple and take a bite out of every apple to make sure that you got the absolute perfect apple. Right, right. Is that feasible then? Like, do you, is that the best uh, strategy? Well, and, and of course, if you're thinking about imagining sitting next to a mm. cart of apples and taking right. a bite out of every apple, I mean, it's, it's an impossible task. I mean, that'd be the equivalent of probably eating Let's say it's how many bites does it take to, to eat an apple? Let's just say 10 bites. Right. It, if a cart of apples had, you know, let's just say it's a small cart with a thousand apples in it. I mean, that'd be the equivalent of eating a hundred apples, which I don't know about you, but I don't think I could eat a hundred apples. See, that that's an interesting observation. Because I think, you know, going back to these big five personalities, uh, you sometimes observe the conscientious people. Uh, they are going through that kind of a drudgery to sort out what's the best option. So, so that, that's also very interesting because you see a lot of the people, um, you know, there, there are at least two kinds of people. One, you know, kind of overthink uh, intellectualize, analyze, and in order to find that optimal part, right? But you sometimes you tend to see that some people, they don't think that much. They start to take actions. They even are willing to go through the drudgery of going through like eating all the apples in order to find. And like compare with a person who are just sitting there and try to observe and, and, and go around that cart of apples and to observe versus somebody start to take action and quickly pick, you know, like eating too much, too many apples, mm -hmm. but maybe end up like fan finding the, that best apple earlier. Yeah. And, and, and tell me how, how would that translate into, you know, we're, we're always talking about balance and not going to extremes. Mm -hmm. What's a balance between eating the first apple that you get in the cart and maybe it's all bruised up and you know you, you could have just spent a little bit more time and and found a a good enough apple and and someone who you know goes through the drudgery of trying to eat a hundred apples every time that they need to make a decision or or perform a a a, a task that that needs to be good enough but doesn't have to be perfect mm. It's a good question. It's not a easy thing for when it comes down to individuals, because as individuals, we have tendencies, right? Some people tend to think more and then take action. Some people take action quicker and figure out along the way. Uh, the people, in, in order to have that balance, it might require a lot of practice. In other words, uh, you have to, uh, if you, let's say you are a thoughtful person, uh, you have to constantly remind yourself, uh, you know, you need to take a little bit of, uh, uh, action quicker to have that attraction uh, or momentum. And then in the middle of it, you are not mindlessly eating up apples. You are discerning, you are thinking, you are figuring. And then by combining those two things, action and uh, perceiving and uh, thinking, uh, you might end up with a more optimal balance. But again, that doesn't come very naturally and easily for most people because yeah. we tend to have tendencies. Yeah. And, and, and so then that's part of this growth mindset in and of itself of you know, maybe that's the first floor or the next floor that we could all work on our temple of 
what's my approach to actions? Am, am I too perfectionistic and I need, and I'm, and I'm, I'm making everything kind of drudgery because it has to be perfect or, or else I'm, I'm terrified of taking an action or I'm, I'm not conscientious enough and the bricks are kind of getting laid haphazardly mm -hmm. and I'm not really creating a good enough structure for what's going to come. And, and maybe that's what we all need to do. But I think that the critical thing, in, and this kind of comes back to um, the, the feng shui and maybe even some more, you know, kind of pop psychology, Brene Brown talks about vulnerability and, and that's getting feedback from people, you know, Hey, you know, what have you noticed about how I do things? Do you think I'm, where do you think I need more work or, you know, do you think I, I, I need to be more conscientious or do you think I'm, you know, too conscientious and, and, and in that vulnerability, then we don't have to rely so much upon just ourselves. It's almost like going back to the, the feng shui We're we're going out into the environment and kind of asking it questions like, Hey, um, you know, what does this next brick need? Does it need more yin or more yang? Does it need to soften or does it need to firm up? You know, wh how am I? How do you perceive me? And not just ask one person, maybe ask a few people to get some different perspectives. But but that requires us, I mean, that's that vulnerability and the courage that comes along with that vulnerability and also kind of being compassionate with ourselves and being compassionate with that process that none of this is about judging ourselves or beating ourselves up. If we can do all this in the spirit of loving ourselves and caring for ourselves and, and kind of holding that hurt little kid inside it, that all of us have that hurt little kid inside that wants to, you know, get what we need out of life. And if we can hold that part of ourselves with compassion when we're doing this process, then I think that we'll be a lot more willing to pick up another brick, wh whichever way we need to pick that brick up. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, as you said, I think feedback plays a good role. I think, you know, like say in uh, executive coaching, a lot of times those blind spots, those things that other people see clearly, uh, you know, once, you know, um, uh, that kind of feedback is uh, captured and, and use that uh, to help the person, right? That, that, that uh, I think that can be very uh, beneficial, uh, self-compassion. I would add another element, uh, which goes back to the title of this chapter. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned the wisdom of time and timing. I think sometimes timing can help us a lot in terms of how we take actions, uh, you know, in, in, in several ways. One is, let's say the timing uh, in this chapter, Lao Tzu talked about, you know, the small things, right? Let's say, you know, somebody who is uh, fearful of a failure, right? So what if that sense of timing, uh, you know, help heightened uh, a little bit when things are still small, but forming, right? And in order, let's say, in order to address it more timely, when it's still manageable, I think that helps people take action. So that's just the timing at the beginning of things. The timing at the, let's say, at the near the end of things, like say on the verge of success. Lao Tzu here talked about, um, Sometimes people fail, you know, on the verge of success. I think that also can heighten people's attention and say, hey, let's just do it. Let's stay focused. Let's keep our eyes on the ball and, 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 and rush through the finishing line. I think all these momentum, opportunities, and uh, triggers and uh, uh, stimulus, I think sometimes can use, you know, from that environment can used as additional uh, force to carry us to uh, carry us uh, toward you know what we are trying to accomplish 
Yeah, that, that, I think that's a, a, a great point because, again, the connection to uh, these methods and practices that we're talking about to what's happening externally, if I'm there building my temple and monsoon season is coming and, and, and the rain is going to start pouring down and it's not going to stop, and, and I have maybe five more rows of, of bricks that I need to get put in place to, so I can put the, the roof on, it might not be the best time to be getting feedback and doing all kinds of analysis about um, r refining my methods for picking up that next brick. I, I probably should just keep picking up bricks whichever way I'm doing it, and and making sure that I get that ceiling put on before monsoon season comes. And then when monsoon season has passed, then or or while it's raining, now that's the time I can get this feedback when it's not a good time to pick up another brick. Now I can get this feedback of from other people of, oh, you know, how did I do that? What what do you think I could do when we're building this next level of of the temple what what might be a better way of going about doing that that's a good point that's a great point i think that sense of sequence or priority at the point in time i think it's is essential because sometimes you see a lot of people are stuck in their own mind or they're so fixated at their plan they don't have that flexibility to adjust and say you know, based on the timing now, this is the most important thing to do. Yeah, that timing is so critical. Am, am I aware of, you know, what stage we're in and things and the external things so that I know, um, you know, which approach to take at, at, at this moment? Do I just need to be impatient and take another action mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or or is this a, a a time to kind of be more reflective right okay we're about uh, at the top of the hour and uh it's been a great uh discussion and to explore together you know this uh this chapter 64. um you know i hope that our listeners also you know, benefit from this discussion. And uh, I certainly do. I learned a lot. I did too, David. And I, I can't wait till we can talk more about Tao Te Ching. Take care.